All right, all right. Hello, Facebook. Let's get this webinar started. And we are now live as well in the webinar. Hello, everybody. Today, whether it is good evening or good afternoon or good morning for you, wherever you are in the world, thank you so much for joining us at this Back to School series for the Percussion Conservatory. My name is Joshua Vonderheide, and I am the founder of the Percussion Conservatory. Today, I am joined by my events manager, Stephen Keener, and our very special guest and featured artist on the platform, Chad Crummel, who is the principal percussionist with the Chattanooga Symphony and is soon to be joining the US Navy Band where he recently won an audition. He's gonna be heading into basic training very soon and uh, we wish him all the best with that. But before he does it, he's gonna present the structured snare. So thank you so much uh, for joining us today, Chad, and for doing this snare drum masterclass with us. We're very excited to hear about how you approach the instrument, how you do your warm ups, how you structure some of your practice sessions, but I will let uh, you speak about it. And Stephen, if you could just hop on and let us know how to use the Q&A and the chat, and then uh, Chad can take it away from there. Hey guys, so good to see everyone. Um, the uh, Q&A button at the bottom of your screen is where you can uh, click there and enter any questions that you might have for Chad as the class goes along. Uh, we might jump in and interrupt him um, if there's something uh, really pressing. Um, or we might save them for the end. Um, so just hang in there to the end of the class and we'll definitely get to all of the questions. Um, you can also use the chat function as well, uh, just to put in any comments um, or if you are, are having any technical difficulties or anything like that um, that you wanna let us know about. Um, so other than that, uh, please enjoy and uh, I'll throw it over to Chad to take it away. Hey guys, well, thanks for the intro. Um, yeah, my name is Chad Crummel, uh, like you heard Josh say, uh, right now, principal percussionist of the Chattanooga Symphony. Literally, tonight is my last concert. And this weekend, I had to uh, basic training for the Navy. And I'll be there for seven or eight weeks or so. And then um, move up to DC and start my new position with the Navy band in DC, which I'm really excited about. Um, when Josh approached me about giving this class um, on snare drum, I had quite a few thoughts about what I wanted to talk about, and it boiled down to the two main pillars of my uh, practice uh, routine. The first being sort of my snare drum warm up. When I say warm up, it doesn't just necessarily mean like let's get the hands moving so then I can get on to the excerpts. It, it is a sort of combined warm up and technique. Uh, you know, exercises and chop building and sort of creative flow um, all wrapped in one that I've sort of uh, gathered over the years and sort of turned into my own uh, unique, unique thing. Uh, and the other half being once I've done all that work and I'm ready to sort of start my session on whether it's uh, an etude or excerpts, um, how do I go about uh, sort of practicing that and, and getting a getting everything sounding tip top shape. And I do the majority of that work uh, with sort of self recording and, and listening back and uh, then sort of isolating certain sections and slowing it down using audacity and technology uh, to, to sort of further hear the, all the nitty gritty stuff that, that's happening uh, in my playing. So those are the two main things we're gonna talk about today. Uh, let's jump back to the first uh, category here, which is the snare drum warm up. Um, I probably, like most of you, went, I don't know how long I went uh, without really having a proper warm up, but I don't remember really having a warm up in, uh, on a snare drum uh, for the majority of my years in school. I don't know how I got away with it. I, I think I just kind of. Uh, you know, I had the bad habit of entering the practice room, grabbing the drum and playing that etude that I needed to play that week or uh, playing that one excerpt that I was trying to work on. And that was my snare practice session. I would just jump right into the thing and play it and then hope that it got better. And that sort of works for a time, you know, when you're in school and you got to learn a lot of stuff. You 
uh, maybe don't have the time to, to spend hours and hours and hours on a <laughs> warm up and technique routine. But um, I, over time, this started to sort of maybe it hurt my snare drum development. And uh, I, I fell into uh, this thing that I built with uh, all the different um, versions of my snare drum warm up. You'll see that it's, it's sort of in, in five parts here. And they all happened at different points in um, in schooling or in my career. I didn't just pick it up all one day and was like, oh, this is now my snare drum thing. It, it was like random pieces from from some teachers, from just certain things that I was around, whether in school or, or, or working. Uh, and I'll sort of talk about these, these five things. Um, the first being actually maybe a, a taboo subject in in the classical world, which is um, drum corps. Uh, I marched drum corps in 2008 and 2009. Um, I was actually in a, in a front ensemble. So I wasn't uh, on the drum line per se, but I was around it all the time and on the bus next to it. And I also taught a lot of drum lines and I've always loved this world of drum corps. I loved uh, the ability that some of these guys had uh, on a drum and the, the chops that they have I know some of it doesn't directly translate into the classical world, but there's a lot of things that are really, really, really useful. Uh, if you can sort of take what you need from that world and, and put it in your, um, you know, your toolbox. Uh, I, I like doing that with certain um, types of playing and that the drum corps has helped me build up my, my classical hands for sure. Uh, so I remember we would just find uh, transcriptions of different drum corps shows, uh, different drum corps warm-ups, and I started to create this PDF that now has like 60 pages of just my favorite shows and warm-ups and, and, and books, and it's a great way to build up chops and build up dexterity and um, really challenge your hands. They, they're playing some <laughs> stupid hard stuff nowadays, uh, and if you can sort of work through that, then all of a sudden, Doku feels a little bit easier uh, if you can play along to some of the best uh, books out there nowadays. So we have that side of thing. Uh, and then that sort of uh, made its way into my snare drum routine. I would start playing these things before, you know, working on an excerpt or whatever. And I didn't really think about it as a warm up at that point, but um, it sort of turned into that. Second, set of things that I have is a is a packet from a, a, a for teacher of mine, Ed Steffen. He has this great snare drum packet called Basic Snare Drum Calisthenics. Uh, and it has a ton of great um, exercises that really challenge your hands in there. And it, it really makes you work on just flow and getting yourself to look and to feel right on the drum, getting comfortable. Uh, when he handed me that packet, it was, tough on my hands and, until it started to make sense uh, and now it's become a, a staple uh, of sort of my snare drum warm-up. The third thing is actually something I started to use as a um, uh, as a sort of long form almost meditative warm-up. Uh, I wanted to I love playing along to like beats and grooves when I'm uh, um, when I'm when I'm warming up and you know, a lot of pop songs, whether you're like playing along to hip hop or rap, whatever the case is, they're all like, they're short, you know, you get two or three minute songs. I wanted something that was just nonstop for like an hour where I could have this hour long arc of a warm up session. Um, and I remembered that um, when I was in, in drum corps, um, I used to listen to Steve Reich's music for 18 to like fall asleep every every night for some reason. I'd put it in my little like Napster MP3 player. And I just loved the effect it had on me. And, uh, and I, I, I saw that and I was like, that's a long piece. It's a steady tempo. It has this, this aura and this vibe about it. And I started just putting this track on and um, warming up and playing along to it. And that sort of turned into my improv warm up. Um, sort of jam <laughs> session, uh, which I think is is uh, it's a nice way to to step away from you know music and and dots on a page and force your hands to 
improv on the spot, you know, I wish I did more of that in sort of the drum set world, but at least I can do it uh, a little bit uh, on the pad. So that turned into this sort of hour long, put on Rice Music for 18 and just flow along to the music and work on different things, getting in and out and make sure you're never, you know, losing the beat or getting tripped up um, and just trying to stay locked in. And it, it turned into my like pre-audition um, sort of mindset. I would just put the headphones on when I walked in, start playing that, and it would follow me through all the warm up rooms and the green room. And so I didn't hear anyone else, you know, uh, when you get there, trying to keep the nerves down and you don't want to talk to your friends just yet and you want to sort of stay in the zone. So I'd put that on and it would just put me in this trance and I would use it to warm up and it would really sort of calm the heart rate down. And uh, it was it's a nice way to sort of get prepared for a an audition where you need to be calm and collected. So that's the third thing. Fourth thing uh, is a book that I ran into. Um, uh, by, by Sean Tilburg. The, the name of the book is The Regiment. Um, it, it's a great book. I, um, I ran into it and um, there are just a ton of really great exercises and warm-ups in there. And I would just sort of work through the whole book as a, as a warm-up. Um, and it really, I could feel the difference it had on my hands that I was ready after that moment to sort of take on some excerpts. And then the fifth thing is uh, basically my collection of snare drum um, solos and and um, different pieces that I've played over the years. I've done two modern snare drum competitions, and each one of those had like nine solos on it. So I just have this stack of music um, along with you know Teo etudes and Tom Kinsey etudes and all this stuff. And sometimes I'll just play through. Um, solos um to, just to just to get comfortable with playing uh, a lot of different types of music and styles so i have these five different things that i sort of found over the years that i started to incorporate into my practice session and warm-up uh, routine now if i were to play all these things it would take like hours so what i do is i'll pick one or two or i'll sort of combine um different parts of them for a certain uh, day of the week. If I'm coming into the practice room and I want to try to build chops that day, then I'm going to look towards the, the drum corps books and try to really work on my hands that way. If I want to <clears throat> play some mock auditions, I will probably put on the Reich and sort of get into that mood. Uh, if I just want to work on some flow and some hand stuff, I'll, I'll use Ed's thing. So I have all these different types of warm-ups that I use um, for different days of the week. So I don't get bored of the same thing. I have a lot of different things that I can pull from uh, and just this sort of mass collection uh, of music. And uh, it really helps, I think, keep the, the practice session uh, fresh. And, and um, you know, I look forward to getting in the room and, and, and playing some of these things. So with that being said, uh, let, let's walk through a few of these here. I'm going to screen share. Uh, this first is going to be probably the, the one I'll use the most. This is um, this is going to be from Ed Steffen's um, packet that he, that he hands out to, to students um, called Basic Snare Drum Calisthenics. And um, one of the things that it that it has uh, is actually just some, uh, I'll usually start with a, uh, a Peter's etude yep. so I'm sure we have all seen this before I love uh, this <laughs> this page of music here I use it for so many things um, not just on the snare drum but a lot of accessories as well triangle tambourine it's just a really simple but effective um, tool that I, that I use. So I will start with this. And I like to do it a few different ways here. Let me check the time.
First way through is I'm gonna play right hand lead the whole way through. I'm really trying to focus on getting my right hand with nice big full strokes and then um, my left hand because it's doing sort of half of the work. Right, it's only playing uh, you know one note per beat here. I need to put a little bit of energy in this left hand to make sure that it has the same sound and character uh, that my right hand does as it's playing sort of the constant eighth notes here. Go through the whole thing right hand lead. Then I'll go through the whole thing left hand lead. I'm really trying to focus on getting that hand that's playing less often to play with just a little bit more uh, focus and attention to where I get an even sound across the board. Right. Go the whole thing left hand lead. Then I'll alternate the whole way through. And then I'll start working in different dynamics. I'll go and play this at a soft dynamic. Right hand lead, left hand lead, alternating. Then I'll start throwing in crescendos, decrescendos, and sort of making it into a piece of music, an etude, part of a symphony, whatever the case may be. Just trying to play more than just the, the, the dots on the page here, um, but trying to get a little, little creative with it. Once I've done this, I feel like my hands are starting to feel and sound uh, a little even across the board. I really use this to try to get an even sound on both hands. I want to have both hands sort of looking and feeling the same. Another thing that I really utilize is a, a mirrors in my practice room. I'm trying to make sure that both hands look the same. They're coming at the pad from the same angle. Um, I'm going. I'm coming from the same heights here. I just want everything to look the same and has the best chance to to sound the same after that. Then once uh, I sort of get out of that, then I'm going to start in um, in edge. Uh, packet here and we start with just some some singles and some dexterity um, a little bit of um, paradiddle uh, work there and then I'll talk about when we get down to the the fives uh, one of the things that I also like to utilize uh, when doing this is play along to some sort of tunes and music beats whatever the case may be and if you um, aren't familiar with the, the website Funklet uh, it is a super cool tool where you can um, pull up a lot of these different groups. Uh, this is a, a Reggie Watts, uh, Reggie Watts Pop Tech 2010. You can set that to any tempo, uh, and I, I really like the just the sort of space that it gives me here to to, to warm up. So I'm going to put this on. So with this, I'm really looking to engage three different parts uh, of my snare drum playing. I want the small muscle groups, I want my fingers to work, I want my wrist to start working, and I want to get my arms involved. And all, uh, all of this can be sort of accomplished in these first few uh, lines here. So any longer notes, slower notes, my arm is involved. Just the run of the mill eighth notes, 
I've got the wrist moving. And then when we get to 30 seconds, or even some of the six lifts, I'm um, getting my fingers involved. So I really want to get everything sort of warmed up and moving and ready to start the day. Right, really lifting up, getting everything up off of the drum. Next thing here, the third line, just some basic pair diddles. When I'm doing these paradiddles, I'm looking to get uh, that last uh, sort of right hand here. So if you look at da 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 da. As soon as that hand can start to pick up for the next um, accent here, I'm getting a nice upstroke and floating up. I'm not coming up the last possible minute, but I'm sort of getting there early so it has this nice slow effect. Using my arm to pull up. This is part of the flow sort of part of my exercise. The next line down, the fives. Uh, we're just playing accent every five notes. There's a little turnaround uh, on the, uh, between the second and third measure. And then we start throwing in different stickings. Alternating. Now we're going to throw in a little left hand double on the fourth and fifth note. One, two, three. Keep going down. We keep changing the sticking just a little bit. Now the double is on the right hand. Lots of different variations on this. The fourth line down, we get just straight four in the right hand, three in the left hand. Okay, now the, the B stop here. Uh, and then we move down to a little double development. Really love this. Working on getting that second note of doubles to really come out of the texture. Trying to develop that second note in doubles, really get our, our diddles nice and clean. Working on that sort of push pull, grabbing that second note. Put it into triplet form. Change the 
sticking around the left hand. Then we have uh, twos to threes, and then it sort of slows down a little bit. This is the uh, third to last line here on, the, on this page. It goes for um, just a little while here. Lots of great information here. We start working into to more and and uh, some some gritting here. I have a whole soft snare drum development, and I'll work my way through a ton of this. Um, this is the majority of what I do in the practice session. I don't just jump straight into the excerpts. I know that if my hands are in shape and strong and ready to play all sorts of different um, <laughs> things that the, the music's going to throw at me that I'll have a, I'll stand a better chance if I'm if I'm prepared and my hands are, are ready so I spend the majority of my time on what I call my warm-up but it's really just it's technique building it's it's chop filling it's um, just getting my hands prepared to then go and play the the etude that I need to work on or the excerpt that I need to work on um, <clears throat> so this is the this is the uh, Ed snare drum packet here. A lot of great information. The next little thing that uh, I can share is this is the uh, little bit of the drum core packet here. I love adding a little bit of drum core playing into um, into my sessions, especially when I'm looking to build up my hands uh, a little bit. So I have a ton of music. I think there's like sixty. Well, no, let's see, there's 41 pages in this, this packet, but I think I have some other stuff everywhere else. Some of it is show music, some of it is um, cadences. Uh, they sort of run the gamut of, of years in drum corps, too. Some old stuff, some new stuff. A lot of it was from around the years when I was marching, just because that was when I was sort of around and became my favorite stuff. Um, what I've really been drawn to recently is um, this sort of series of, of blue coat uh, warm-ups from I believe it's around 2012 2013 they started to do stuff a little bit different um, they took away the blaring like met <laughs> uh, or like um, you know uh, just the, the sort of typical uh, drum line goop, 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 goop. and uh, they started having someone have a little uh, mini drum set or a little kit here and he would have in-ear uh, monitors he would be listening to a map but he would just be playing a groove on the drum set and the battery would be around him and they would play along to that groove rather than playing along to just one two three four in a, with a metronome um, so this comes from this comes from that sort of world this is uh fluid molar modulations and you can just look up um actually let me uh let me screen share some of the uh, what it looks like here. So actually, this is the this is that Funklet uh, website, a really cool um, source here. It has a ton of great um, things you can choose from. I've been stuck on this Reggie Watts uh, Pop Tech 2010. You can change the um, the tempos on all these, which is which is really fun. So I'm gonna get into the drumline uh, warm ups here. This is called Slam Jam. This is sort of another thing what I was talking about. This is combining that, that um, getting ready, getting warmed up and improvising a little bit. What they do is just sort of have a groove going and everyone is playing kind of whatever they want on top of that as long as it's fitting in into this, this groove and this style. You can have a little bit of that, uh, little bit of that here. I'll use this to get my, my drum core session started. I love the the energy and the, the the hype that it brings. You don't really get that in the the classical world, so it's fun to bring some some life into it. And uh, so I'll play a few minutes of this, and you'll see sort of where this goes. Everyone takes a little solo.
Everyone's playing something different here. Uh, it's just fitting into this groove, getting your hands ready, sort of getting the vibe ready to start playing. great thing about playing this and not actually being in drum corps so you don't have to follow all the rules you don't have to stand up nice and straight you don't have to have your sticks ready at all times you can sort of be relaxed and prepared i take what i want from this and leave the other stuff behind i'm not super into maybe these ex some of the extreme stick heights and dynamics i do like to get my wrist moving just a little bit but i try to leave some of the things behind maybe like well, a lot of the <laughs> stick, uh, stick tricks and whatnot doesn't really apply to me. Uh, maybe some of the really intense downstrokes that you can see in drum corps. Just try to stay a little bit more relaxed. I think these guys do a really good job of staying loose and staying relaxed. You'll see some lines have a little more intensity about them uh, as far as like tension on the stick. So I, I feel like these guys do a good job of sort of staying away from that. I just like their overall vibe and demeanor. So you can see where this goes. This goes on for a while. It actually transitions into just a simple eight on a hand exercise. Once they get that, then um, we move into the Actually, let me go back and uh, I'm going to screen share the, the music here. This one's called molar modulation and a uh, really neat exercise if you get a chance to take a look at it. Going back and forth between sort of straight eighth notes with an accent every four into the nines across the bar with an accent every three. Really working on that uh, sort of molar technique here. So I'll play along to their, their recording here. I love the way this works your hands. If you want to build up strength and sort of speed, this is a, is a great way to, to, great exercise for this. And to introduce that sort of relaxed molar stroke, I just, I love the, the things that it adds to my uh, playing here. The next is going to be a paradiddle exercise.
So I love what this sort of uh, helps me build up. It's keeping me relaxed when I'm playing sort of fast, constant paradiddles. Uh, another thing that I think often gets overlooked is um, in this sort of drum line, drum core type of playing, um, obviously there's a huge emphasis on uniformity across the line as far as matching stick heights and matching um, the look. And the easiest way to do that is to make sure everyone is you know, playing these um, heights nine and three with proper downstrokes. I feel like downstrokes, they no, no, sometimes get a bad rap because in like, um, you know, tension and playing or whatever the case may be, but you need to have the ability to do downstrokes um, and to do them without tensing up, do a proper downstroke, just, you know, stopping this, stopping the stick after it has hit the head without any sort of tension in the hand. Um, this is going to save your butt in a lot of playing, um, whether it's, I mean, think of Dale Kool-Aid tunes, they're constantly la 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 you have to get from one dynamic to the other efficiently uh and without sort of tapering off the loud end to get soft and then sneaking up the soft end to then get loud you have to be able to hit these sort of peaks and valleys in the music and a lot of that comes from proper um you know just your four main stroke types whether it's full stroke down stroke tap and up right so what I teach all of my students, you have those four things, sort of the basis for everything that, uh, that, that comes around that. And to do a proper downstroke uh, without any tension and to get from loud to soft is super important. And I feel like the drum core music keeps you on top of that because of the nature of um, you know, the way things are structured there. So I could jump down a rabbit hole with the, with the drum core stuff. I've got, you know, there's like show music in there and that stuff will really stretch your hands. This is, these are just the, the, the warmups, uh, but I think they're uh, a good source to, to try to build up hands and chops. Um, so go out and, and find your own favorite things to play um, and, uh, and just work, work through that. A lot of the things that I'm saying here today aren't like the, this isn't the end all be all snare drum uh, way of doing things. This is what I've collected over my years, what works for me. And really the point of this class is to try to get you to find those things in your playing, in your life, the music that you like playing that helps develop your hands and build that into your own snare drum, warm up, technique, routine, whatever you want to call it. So these are the things that I'm doing. Um, and I want to try to inspire you to, to, to find the same. So you don't just walk into the practice room and start playing your etude right away and then say like, okay, I think I got a, a little bit better, right? Do other work outside of that. It'll build up your hands um, and make your playing a little bit easier. Uh, so the third thing I talked about is the sort of improvising along to, to Steve Reich. Uh, I won't demonstrate that here. It's just, you just put on the track, whether it's Reich or any other music that um, you can play along to and just just improvise to it. Just get your hands ready to flow and to play and try to get creative. Get your hands moving all different dynamic levels. Um, and uh, this was, that was just the, the piece that sort of, I don't know, I'm not tired of it yet and I've been using it for, for years. Maybe I'll get tired of it one day and uh, move on to, to something else, but it's, um, um, it's what works for me. And it's a recording that I'm actually on. It was a recording from Tanglewood, summer of 2012. Um, uh, I came out there to, to to sub, basically. They needed a whole bunch of extra percussionists. They were doing a big opera and a big orchestra week and Reich Music for 18, so like, they needed a ton of subs. And there were like 20 percussionists out there for a few weeks, and we made this great recording of Reich Music for 18, and um, that's the, the one that I used to, to warm up with. Um, hey, Chad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, all of this is awesome um, and this uh, is really, really cool. We had a couple questions in the chat. Uh, it might be a good time to ask them. And I was also gonna, I was also wondering just about the drum core stuff. Uh, where do you uh, find that stuff? Do you buy it from a website or like, how do you come across all those exercises and music? Oh man, there used to be a website that people would transcribe the music from that summer and just throw it up there. I haven't been to that website in so long that I don't remember the name and I also don't <laughs> remember 
Oh, I don't even know if it still exists. I would have to sort of rack my brain. Maybe someone could throw it in the chat if they know what I'm talking about. There's, there was like, when I was marching, there was like the website that had like all of the years of music and all of the show stuffs because they were sort of, you know, third hand transcriptions. Sometimes they had mistakes and whatnot, but it's pretty close. Um, and there's a ton of information on there. I will try to look that up and maybe we can attach it to the, to the, the video afterwards. Um, but there are some of the stuff you can buy. Um, you know, you can buy like the blue coats, like warm up packet, I think. And there, I'm sure there are other things out there, but there was a, there was a website that had just like everything you could download PDFs. So I'll, I'll look into that. Um, uh, but there's, cool. there's a lot of stuff out there. Yeah. Yeah. I was just on the blue coats website kind of browsing around. It does look like they have, uh, some techniques, packets and things like that for every instrument, their brass instruments too. Um, so I'm sure you could go to individual core websites and probably find a lot of that stuff. Like you said. Um, a couple other questions that popped up here um, that we can throw in now. I uh, wondered if you have anything in your warmups for working on like soft dynamic, soft rolls. You kind of mentioned that, um, get back into that. And also four stroke roughs. Um, how, do you, how do you work on um, those? Do you incorporate that into your warmups at all? Yeah, for sure. Um, that sort of comes in some of the, the different uh, um, five <laughs> warmup programs that I have. Um, in later on in Ed's packet, there is a whole like roll section and there is a whole soft snare drum section. Um, I'll use those, but I'll try to use anything that I play loud. I'll try to also play soft. If I want to do a whole soft snare drum, um, session, I will play those definitely those, uh, the Peters intermediate, those number one and number two. Um, you know, playing those at, at soft dynamics, playing even um, just the first few pages of Ed's stuff. Anything that if you can play loud, you should try to play soft too. Some of it will really stretch your your hands, and and you know you'll never end up playing like all a bunch of really 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 crazy stuff down soft. But if you can do the really 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 crazy stuff down soft, then you can probably do Kiji. You know, if you stretch your hands to that point where you can you can play really difficult stuff at a soft dynamic, then everything else becomes a little bit easier. I mean, really, Kiji isn't that complicated <laughs> in the grand scheme of things. Um, it's just, uh, I don't know, we sort of make it out to be um, because it's this, I don't know, it's this sort of thing that we have to play all the time. But if you can play stuff that's harder than that, then it sort of takes off some of the pressure, I think. Um, so the roles in the, the soft narrative stuff, actually some of that comes up in this next section here, which is Sean Tilburg's um, book, The Regimen. And uh, if you don't have it, if you don't know it, go grab a copy. It's, it's, it's really good. It's really informative. Uh, it has some great exercises in there. One of the things that I'll play here and screen share is something called uh, multi-stroke jam. Let's pull this up. This is just one of the pages from from the book here, but um, it's a funky little uh, passage that the first few times you try to play it, you're gonna get tripped up on. It has some really weird stickings, um, but if you can get past that, you can get it to flow. Um, I think it's a it's a nice sort of warm up. I love this little thing. It's weird, it's funky, um, but it's cool once you get uh, get the hang of it here. And yeah, like I said, his, his book, it just does a really good job of going from the basic fundamental things that you need and just working all the way through um, anything that you, you need to work on. It has an exercise for it and has a great little passage about how you should be approaching it. Um, 
I find myself just just using just the whole book as a as a warm up. I'll just work through each of the um, the etudes. I think I actually did that was the majority of what I was doing in the practice room before the the Navy audition. Um, I just found that it, it gave me like the best possible condensed warm up. Um, was working through some of these etudes here. Um, going over to the building up roughs, um, I use this a lot. This is from the same book here. Just working on it in four different speeds um, and, and going from sort of slow to slow to fast here. So I'll show what that looks like. So I really like the way this forces you to, to slow down the rough and focus on that critical, if you're doing the sticking right, left, left, right, getting those two left hand, that double to, to increase in volume. And going back to some of the work we talked about in Ed's packet, getting that second note to be a little bit louder than the, the first note really helps you shape these, these, um, these roughs here. You know, the right hand's got it easy. You just got a sort of a elongated version of what we're the same thing we're talking about, the left hand. Sort of soft and then loud. The left hand's got the work to do. I also love the way it forces you to think about it as a rhythm. I think a lot of the times we see this in music and we sort of just play a collection of notes and try to get the last one to land on the downbeat. Um, and that can work for a number of things, but I really like to think about them as, as rhythms and to know whether or not I'm playing it on, you know, starting on the last 16th note of the beat or starting on the last triplet of the beat, or if I can really open it up and really play it starting like that second line there, starting it on the and of the beat, you know, depending on the tempo and the context and the music and the composer and all this stuff, you can have a different variety of these these roughs here, and think about them as rhythms. I think this this exercise really helps that. So you can do this at the loud dynamic, and then work your way down soft, where you're playing them at key G volume, and um, this will really help uh, build up your your roughs. He has a ton of roll exercises as well. And I'm gonna, when I do roll exercises, I tend to pull out a drum for this, just the sensation of a, a head. It's a little different than a, than a pad. And um, I wanna sort of make sure that I'm getting the proper pressure and density of these rolls. And so I'll, I'll pull out a drum. But a lot of the work that I do beforehand is just on a pad. Some of that's just from, I don't know, saving my ears. It's a small room, I'm trying to <laughs> keep volume down. Luckily, I live in a house and, and not an apartment, so I can I can play as loud as I want. But um, it's nice to just uh, keep things calm for the first half of the session, because eventually you do have to play on a drum and and uh, spike up the volume a little bit. So one of the first things I'll do to build up um, if we're going to sort of the roll uh, next, and this is a this is a whole separate part of the, the warm up, really. I'll, I'll get the hands moving first, and then I have to warm up my roll as well to work on it. Um, and I think this sort of takes us into the next um, session that I'm talking about here, which is utilizing technology to, to sort of better your, your playing. And um, the setup I have here in the practice room is I always have a sort of mic hooked up to the computer and I'll just pull up. I like using Audacity, some people like using Logic, whatever the case is, um, I want sort of instant feedback from, from my playing when I start working on something. You know, I'm out of school now, I have no longer have a teacher, so I have to be the teacher. 
and um, sometimes when you're playing, uh, you, you miss some of the things that um, uh, that maybe are present as a as a third party listener. So I like to go back and listen to uh, instead of playing through something twice, I'll play through it once and use that time to to listen back and uh, to really try to to break down all the the, the gunk that's in the the playing. Uh, one of the first things I'll do for a snare drum sort of warm uh, roll warm up is I believe this is from it's from a Peter's book but it's from one of the weird ones I think it's like uh, I don't even know what it's called like something dexterity I saw someone play it once and it just sort of made sense to me so it's a really easy thing to pick up on let me just uh, double show you here. We have our right hand that's building up the roll first, playing one note every uh, every bar there, and then two notes, and then three notes in the right hand, then four notes, and we switch to our left hand, one, two, three, four, and we combine them together and start elongating that roll, building the roll. Once again, everything I play loud, I'll try to play soft. So I'll take the roll down and do the same sort of build up at the low end. Trying to get each hand to work the same way. Now, when I want to sort of see what the inside of the roll looks like, this is when I'll use the um, recording feedback here. So I'll screen share this for you. This is Audacity. Um, I just love how simple it is to use. I can hit R, and there's the hotkey to record. I can stop it right away, and I can use this to uh, it uses to to sort of hear the you know, the density in the rolls, and then um, I'll show you how I sort of play things back to half speed here. So we'll take the same thing. Actually, listen back at um, at half speed. I'll go into effect, change speed, uh, cut it down by 50 here. I'll, I'll zoom in a little bit. And now I'm looking to get those three bounces out of my my roll at this at this speed. So it should be da 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 figure about da 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 figure about da 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 figure about figure about da 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 da. I can listen for it, and I can also see the audio waves here and uh, and see what they look like. You know, you'll see a little bit of fall off from that third third note, and the tendency is to sort of crush them a little bit as well. We'll hear all of the all of the dirt here.
not great here. Yeah, so I was hitting the, the right rhythms when it was by itself. When I combine the hands here, I'm already seeing that, okay, something's a little bit, I'm changing something whenever I get both hands together. So I'll work through this and try to just clean it up. When I'm, when I'm really in shape, uh, the, the, you know, the goal of this is to get it just, you know, solid three notes on each hand here. Um, and this is something that you might not necessarily hear at the, at the full speed, but maybe you're just like, the roll is, isn't quite there. I don't know what it is, but it's just, something's not quite right. This is a way to sort of dive down into the, uh, into the muck and sort of, um, tear it apart a little bit. I, I think this is the, this is one of the main things I do as far as excerpts and, and, um, and etudes, whatever I'm working on for an audition. This is the majority of the work that I'll do is listening back at half speed. If I can get it to sound great at half speed, then I know that it is super polished um, at, at full speed. And this all came from an old teacher, uh, Tony Edwards at, at, at UT. When I first started working on excerpts, he... Um, I was like, I'm gonna make a tape for Aspen. And he's like, okay, make the tape. So I made it and I remember like, you know, I just started learning all those Alphon things and, you know, it would take me like 25 tries to get one Porgy and Vess that was uh, note perfect for the for the tape. And I was super pumped. I brought it to him the next lesson. I was like, all right, here's my Porgy for the thing. And, and he did this, he put in Audacity and he slowed it down and it was like, dude, dude, do, 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 do. You just hear all this like push and pull and weird sway from, you know, not even left hand. And um, it really opened my eyes to like, oh, there's like a whole nother way to listen to these things. Like you, you hear it at full speed and you're just like, it's fine. It's you're, you're hitting the right notes and it's you're playing 16th notes, but something isn't quite right about it. Um, and just listening back at half speed, you can really it, it makes you super embarrassed uh when you when you when you hear it for the first time and when you do it to students and whatnot they're just like oh no uh, and that was that was definitely me uh and if you can get it to the point where it's like robot do, do, da, do, do, da, do, do, da, do, da, then at full speed it just sounds like just pristine and beautiful so i'll do this for all my tapes um i, I this is the i you know the sort of way of thinking about um this is what they call the marginal gains side of things. You know, if you're, if anyone is a fan of, uh, I mean, a lot of sports are implementing this, you know, I, I don't know where it necessarily started. I think some F1 and I know I'm uh, in a lot of cycling. I follow a lot of cycling. There's this idea of marginal gains where, and I think this can be applied to, you know, what we do a lot is everyone at auditions, you know, where the top people say the top 20 people, they're all really good, right? They are all gonna play things really, 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 really well. If you think about an excerpt from a scale of zero to a hundred, you know, and you're trying to, a hundred is absolutely perfect and zero is you haven't started learning it yet. You know, the first 50% is easy to accomplish, right? You, you learn the notes, you learn the rhythm and you, you play it and you've, you've like knocked off half of the, the work at that point, right? It's presentable, sort of, you know, and then you start polishing it. Okay, it's, uh, you get the sound right, you get the, the quality right, the character right, that bumps it up to 75%. And you, then you really start dialing in like the rhythm um, and, you, and you bump it up a little bit more. At some point you reach, you know, say you're in grad school, or you're out of grad school and you've been playing these excerpts for a long time. They, it gets really hard to, to make them better at a certain point. It's easy at the beginning and then it gets harder and harder and harder and harder. You're just playing it. You're like, it's kind of the same every time. I don't know, it's good. Sometimes it's a little better than other times, but it's generally here. And what you want to try to do is find just tiny little differences um, along the way that is, uh, you know, this it's a half a percent. You fix this little thing, it's a, it's a half a percent bump. You fix this little thing, it's another, you know, three quarters of a percent. You do enough of those over time enough of those marginal gains and it adds up to three or four percent you know you fix all these tiny tiny little things and i think self-recording and listening back at half speed allows you to hear some of these tiny 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 things um 
you start chipping away at that 93% up to oh, 94, 95, and then you start getting, you know, close to quote unquote on a hundred or perfect. Nothing is ever perfect, but as close as you can get, it's just going to give you a little more leeway in the audition. Um, just to try to, you know, you're trying to get everything to be as polished as possible. So I love this idea of marginal gains and, and just chipping away, chipping away at it until, um, until it finally is, is good. So I'll do one more example of this here. Um, going to be something I'll do. I like I like using this excerpt. This is Nielsen. This is uh, sort of starting at number 29 uh, in, in Nielsen here. So I'm going to hit record and put on my metronome. And before I even attempt to play this at the quiet dynamic, um, I'm going to play it at a comfortable volume. I want to get these, these rhythms are really difficult. There's a lot of space in the air here. Um, and you have a lot of shifts from these 30 second notes into the 16th note triplets. I like to think about it as a driving a stick shift car. You have to just every downbeat, uh, where you're shifting rhythms, it's like putting into a new gear and you're constantly going back and forth between third and fourth gear and you have to shift right on the downbeat can't be any sort of sway uh, in the middle here. So I'm gonna play it at a comfortable volume to try to know what it feels like and sounds like. And I'll listen back half speed. Once I can get it to be solid at a uh, comfortable volume, I'll start bringing it down and bringing it down. Take that first half there. I'll go back in. Drop down to half speed. And listen back. So already right away, I'm finding little bits, little things. They're like, okay, that's not quite. Uh, I'm noticing the right those all the space. Uh, it was just it wasn't quite lining up right. I'll go back. I'll try to find the right space for that at a comfortable dynamic. I'll try to find the right uh, and, and a lot of this is it's trying to get balanced right hand to left hand as well. And you can see, um, I love looking at the sort of the you know, at the computer screen, looking at the, all the different little lines, like, oh, okay, my, my right hand is constantly louder than my left hand. Okay, cool. I'm freeing the left hand up. This is sort of the same idea that I talked about at the very beginning. Uh, when our right hand is playing sort of that constant motion, the left hand is interjecting a little bit. It tends to lag a little bit. It tends to have a different character. You need to sort of put your mind into it and, and beef up that left hand just a little bit. So this kind of work is... A lot of what I'll do. You can take this idea and put it with Scheherazade. You can put it with Kiji. Playing stuff, slowing it down, listening back, and just trying to pick apart all the little things that are inaccurate and just a little bit off. When you can finally get it to sound nails at a at a slow tempo, undo the half speed, you know. Um, slow down and listen back and you're like, okay, I think I'm pretty, pretty happy with that, the way it sounds. And then you can start working on 
um, you know, all the other things like, okay, maybe you know, I'm gonna try a different stick here. I'm gonna try a different drum with a different amount of muffling. You can work on those things after you have the, the excerpt locked in. Um, so I guess the, uh, the, the main parts of the class here, building your own um, warm up uh, routine, grabbing things from all over the place that you've played, that you like to play, that you know that help develop your hands and building that into your own warm up routine. And then uh, once we get through that and our hands are nice and ready, and you've built out the chops and the finesse and the ability to do what you need to do, work on those excerpts and um, try to try to polish them up from getting bumping up the percentages. You know, if you're at 90%, try to just chip away all the little things that are bothering you about that excerpt and uh, use self-recording and, and, and use the technology that we have nowadays to, uh, to uh, listen back. I know you tell like former teachers and whatnot, and they're like, back in my day, we had a, a tape deck that you, you know, <laughs> recorded it and then you'd have to slow it down. And they're like, oh, you kids nowadays with your computers and whatnot. Like, yeah, we have it easy. We can, you can do this. I, luck, I have the luxury of, you know, nice microphones and this studio monitors here. You know, if you're in school, you're not going to have that set up in a practice room because you're moving from room to room each day. Find something that works for you, whether it's, you know, the little plug-in microphone on a, on a phone or external mic plug into your computer. Whatever the case is, do find something that you can do that is portable and easy that you can use every day. It's not a hassle to set up. You want it to be easy to use um, and, uh, and use, it, use it to your advantage. Awesome. Chad, thank you so much uh, for, for the class here. I'm just switching us back into gallery. Um, just so much, so much there to be learned. That was so, so much good information. You packed in a ton into that class. So thank you for doing that. We're, we're going to keep moving here on the Q and A, uh, cause we have a lot of great questions. I'm, I'm actually going to start from the bottom and go back up just to make sure that we're getting to everyone's, uh, questions. So one, one person has asked here, how do we get better in traditional grip? Yeah, great question. So this, <laughs> this came up um, with my most recent audition. With the audition in the Navy band, I had to play um, a solo with traditional grip. They wanna, you know, part of our job description is um, the ceremonial band and we sling on a, a, a rope drum and um, we have to be able to, um, you know, we're not, we're not playing the, the same stuff that like the old guard guys are doing. <laughs> But we have to be able to play some uh, some stuff and look look competent. Um, and so, myself, I, even though I have all this drum corps experience and I grew up in Texas and marching band and all this stuff, I actually never marched a line where I played traditional grip in high school. I played match grip um, in drum corps. I was in the front ensemble, and I, I would never marched on a line that played traditional grip. I've always sort of dabbled in it and played around with it here and there, you know, as you do, but. Uh, I was never like, I never had that skill. So before this audition, I knew I needed to just work on that. And so I would do a whole snare drum warm up routine, match grip, get my hands ready. And I would do the same thing with traditional grip. I would go through all the same warm ups, all the same exercises, but just with traditional grip. Um, and just building up that it's a completely different motion and different muscles involved and the, the the flexibility, that was my biggest thing. I was always trying to get the flexibility um, to, to bring my hand back here. So just whatever you do with match grip, do it with traditional grip and uh, and, and try to build up your, your hands that way. There's nothing, you don't need to play anything different. Just play music uh, with a different grip and, and try to build up your hands that way. Right, yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I had only played traditional grip in high school. Uh, yeah, fun fact for those who didn't see our Facebook post, Chad and I grew up at like basically neighboring high schools. Our dads taught at the same high school. His dad was the band director and my dad was the choir director. So just a little fun anecdote. And yeah, it, it, in, in my high school years, I, I just marched one year of snare drum and played traditional grip. But we did spend, um, you know, as Chad is saying, I spent half the year playing matched grip in like our symphonic concert band, but I spent a solid four or five months out of the year on drumline stuff playing traditional grip. 
So I, I really think the only way to get better at it and to feel comfortable with it is to really play it a lot because the motion is so different. It's sort of like um, even more so than even more so than like, oh, I know how to play four mallets. I'm going to switch from Stevens to Burton or something like this. It's basically like I play snare drum. Now I want to play marimba. It's like that different. <laughs> it's like basically a completely different technique. So it is important to spend a lot of hours doing it. And I would say like, uh, I don't have a, embarrassingly, mm -hmm. my stick is far away. It's behind me. But you know, when, when you do hold it, just remember that your the motion is coming from like a completely different muscle here so it is a it is a twisting motion so you have to develop a completely different muscle in your arm um and, and the thing that i found was yeah. that i would get so tired and so sore five minutes into a practice session you know and i would sort of know like okay like as much as i can do on that today i'll come back tomorrow and see if i can do a little bit more and you really had to build up the muscle and the strength to, to, to do that. Take it easy. Take it slow. Don't injure yourself. Um, listen to what your arm is telling you and uh, just sort of go at it that way. But it'll, it'll, it takes a while. It just takes time to develop. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, okay, since, since I don't have my – this is my, uh, my – what do you – a stylus pen, right, so I can, like, go on my iPad or whatever um, – so the question is, must have sticks, etudes, method book, and practice pad for every orchestral snare drummer. So that could be just like rapid fire. So sticks, etudes, and method books. We, we talked about some etudes and method books that you use, but what is your practice pad and what are your must have sticks? Oh man, I mean, I don't know. I've gone through a lot of practice pads. This one I was using here is a Beatle pad. Um, I think they gave it to me when I won the snare drum competition. And I don't know, it's just the one that I use. But I have like an old Vic Firth one around. And I think I have like a real feel one around. I don't know. You just collect pads as a drummer. <laughs> I don't think any of them are necessarily better than the other. I just I kind of like this one. How do you spell uh, that, Chad? Beetle pad. Uh, like a like little bug, the beetle. Um, the beetle bug. Okay, so two yeah, yeah. double e. I, I like the way it, I like the way it looks. It looks like a like a kitchen cutting board. You know, it's like a hefty. It's a hefty pad. It's not a portable one, but it's a hefty. It's a good pad. Sticks, I don't know, I, uh, I think I've got like three different, I've got like, you know, IP sticks, I've got, I studied in Pittsburgh, uh, so Andy Reamer, uh, you know, makes sticks here, I've got three or sticks, just find what works for you, find, buy different sticks, and everyone is a little bit different, they all can work, <laughs> they're all sticks, find what you like to play with, what makes it the easiest to play with, um, it just yeah i i've switched over the years sometimes i'll i'll i don't know I just a certain stick just i it, it doesn't work for me anymore and then i'll just switch to something else and i'm like oh this feels great <laughs> i don't know i'll just switch sticks randomly yeah um, so steven do, steven do you have a go-to pad or any go-to snare drum sticks or stuff no i'd have to say i agree with chad uh whatever pad is around is the one i pick up and use and <laughs> Yeah. You know, yeah. I've got just the, the same pair of sticks that I've had for years and they just feel good and nothing else is going to do that. So stick with those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For me, I mean, I've got, I've had a real feel back there since I was in eighth grade or something. I mean, you get like, if you buy it and if you invest in one nice pad, it'll last you basically your whole life. Just keep it clean. Um, I had to like wash that one down for a little while because it, <laughs> I mean, it goes everywhere with you, you know, like, <laughs> It's embarrassing, but like eventually, yeah, they get like a little moldy even like, you know, you take it outside like, you know, hey, go to the beach, play your drum every once in a while, something like this, right? You play it outside a lot, your pad will, you need to clean it. Um, so yeah, there there are many, many options to that. I, I want to keep moving through, through some of these questions. Um, when I learn a new piece, should I sight read the piece straight away or should I identify, should I identify the challenging parts and work on those particular passages first? Um, I think everyone's got their own way to, to get through music. Mine, I'm usually will try to play it through, um, just roughly and I'm really trying to play it through at the tempo. If it's a snare drum thing, mallet thing, a little bit different. You have to learn notes and whatnot, but say talking about snare drum, um, I'll try to play it through at the tempo because I want to know like what stickings are going to work in the long run, what roll bass is going to work in the long run. I don't want to start really slow and be playing it different than how I'm going to have to play it at the end. Mm -hmm. So I'll try to identify 
okay, this I know I'm going to need to double this because it's whatever, or this roll base. Okay, I can do everything in 16th notes. Once you sort of get the idea of how it's going to work, then slow it down and whatever method you use, whether it's, you know, bumping it up a few clicks here and there and then back down and then up, and, you know, stair step or whatever you do, um, just, uh, you know, just work your way through it. But identify the, those, I think those key things at the beginning, the, the stickings that you're going to need and the, 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 ro the rhythm of your rolls or the roll base, mm -hmm. um, that's going to set you up for success later on. Um, and then uh, just, yeah, work your way through it. Use some self-recording. Um, use what you need to. I would say that's a great, yeah, what you just mentioned there at the end. The self-recording can be a really nice transition from, uh, you know, I'm learning this piece to I'm performing this piece. It's like, how well do you really know this piece? Right. <laughs> like as soon as you as soon as you listen back to yourself playing it, um, you'll know, you know, you have all your answers. That's the truth. It's like listening to the recording. So I find in general, both with with myself out of laziness, basically, but especially with students that I've coached over the years, people start recording themselves too late in the process. They record themselves like maybe two days before the performance. And by that, it's like way too late by that time. You have all these, you hear these things for the first time. You want to start making changes and you need to be already in the flow state. So it's important when we do talk about self-recording, start that process as early as possible. Basically, as soon as you've learned the notes, uh, you can start self-recording. You can start working on the rhythms. Uh, you know, you can break it down into those sections. So when you're saying, when should I start? You know, should I identify the challenging parts? Of course you should. That's a great idea. Identify those challenging parts and record them. Um, those are those are key things to do. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll use the recording months out. And then I do get to a point where I, you need to transition off of that and you need to get into sort of mock audition mode. If we're talking about orchestra auditions here, um, you know, I, I do record those mock auditions, but uh, in, I'm listening to it in a different way. I'm listening to it at, at real speed. What is the committee going to hear, you know? And then we sort of we move it into that. That's a whole different topic there. But yeah, I'm recording like early on. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. I'm glad to hear you say that because uh, that validates like my thought process on that very, very much so. Yeah, that's good. Um, here is another question. Uh, you kind of have touched on this one. H how do I improve the concert snare roll? Did we already do this question, Stephen? Am I, am I doubling up? No, I mean, yeah, I think we can get into it a little more. I mean, we were talking about, um, you know, the Peters uh, exercise for working on roles and getting the triple bounces, but anything else you do to just work on roles at different dynamics, things like that? Yeah, I mean, there are different books that are all going to have different role exercises. Once again, find what works for you. Uh, some of the, I use some of the ones from um, Sean Tilburg's book. And, and some role things from, from that Peters that I talked about and some from Ed's uh, packet that I know that work for me. Um, so just play lots of different things, find different music, find different um, role exercises and find whatever works for you. Yeah, um, I, I think We've more or less. Oh, no, there's two here at the bottom. Okay. I would like to work on De La Cluse etudes, but it's a bit intimidating to me. How do I know if a particular piece uh, is maybe too challenging for me or that I'm just not ready for it yet? Hmm. That's an interesting question. Um, I mean, you'll only know if you uh, <laughs> take a stab at it. Um, don't, don't shy away. I mean, one thing you can do with uh, De La Cluse etude that you know, there's there's a lot of information in those etudes. They can be really tricky. Um, one thing that you can do to sort of water it down is take out any grace notes, uh, take out any flams, take out the extra little bits that that's what makes De La Cluse hard. All like the little notes in between notes, it's what makes it hard. Take that out. Just learn the rhythms, learn the um, the dynamics, get the foundation down first. Um, see if you can do that, and then if you can, sometimes I'll, I'll start with just the, the foundation of a Dale Cluse. Then mm. anything that has a, a rough or a three stroke, whatever, I'll just turn it into a flam. So everything is a, is a flam. I can do that. Okay, I'll start adding in the, you know, I'll start making it harder and harder and harder and getting it to, to what's actually printed on the page. But just strip away all the 
all the hard stuff first and just learn the rhythms, learn the notes. Then you can sort of build it up and you'll probably surprise yourself. You'll, you'll, uh, you know, take a stab at it and uh, you'll never know until you try. So go for it. That's, that's such an obvious answer. And I've never heard anyone say that before. I've never, I've, I've actually never even thought about practicing the day of those with no ornaments at all. Um, and that's, that's even good advice just for playing those, playing those etudes with better rhythm. I mean, that's a, yes. that's a great way to practice anything. Just take the ornaments out. But I've never, I've never thought about that way from the, from the standpoint of like, wow, this is an extremely challenging etude. Let's, you know, break it down to component parts that like skeleton style. That's, that's cool. Um, yeah. Another thing I was going to say, another thing I've done with those and maybe Chad, I, I don't know if you've sure. done this as well, but do you establish all your role bases for those etudes like beforehand? like how many strokes in each roll. I'll often practice them with just the roll base. You know, if it's a six note, I'll just play a six tuplet. Um, yeah, yeah, instead yeah, of actually sure. playing yeah, the roll. Even the same idea as I'm talking about, stripping out all the hard stuff. If you want to include the rolls as the hard stuff, like you said, yeah, finding your roll base. That's, like I said, that's one of the first things I'll do when I'm learning a piece, finding out what works. And then, so taking out all the extra ornaments and then taking out the rolls and just playing the rhythm of the rolls whether it's 16th or sixth top load or whatever the, whatever the case is, making it doable and easy, get the foundation of the piece, um, and then uh, then you can build up from there. If you're constantly tripping over, you know, little things here and there, you're not really working on the piece in a efficient way. If you're if you're constantly, uh, you know, messing up things, so make it to where you can play it, and then slowly build up. Awesome. Um, we, I think we have just a couple questions left, but before we get to them, I have to take one pause in the masterclass and I have to give my spiel guys. I have to ask you to help us on our mission and to, to help us fulfill the vision. So really quick, I just want to mention that, um, we do have uh, a donation link set up for these masterclasses. There's a suggested donation of $20. If you've watched the entire back to school series, it's $50. Um, and anyone who attended the series, I can also give you a certificate. So if anyone is watching and they'd like a certificate for their school, like a certificate of completion, we can let you know how many hours the total series was and uh, put your name on it and I'll sign it for you. Ta -ta. And uh, we'll, we'll get that right over to you via email. So if anyone needs that, do let me know. Um, but the link to donate, we can drop it here in the chat, is uh, this. It is HTTPS colon backslash link tr.ee backslash the pc and it's on the facebook um post as well and out oh, steven steven do you mind copy and pasting that and send it to the chat of everyone i sent it i sent that to a direct message to steven guys and <laughs> if, if you guys if you can't donate it's really okay we, we, we understand that many of us have been like very you know, intensely impacted by COVID, or maybe it's not a great time, or maybe you're a student and you have other expenses. If that's the case, please just share this. Wherever you're watching right now, share it with everyone you know. Take out your phone, take a picture of the stream, put it on your Instagram and tag us, tag Chad, tag me, tag the Percussion Conservatory, and just share this with everyone because the, the, it's really, really working. Um, just today, we had another 25 people follow us on our social media platforms getting ready for Chad's class. And as you guys are sharing this and as it's going around, we also, we love to hear from you. So send us your comments, you know, send us emails, let us know what you wanna see. Um, because what you guys want to see is what we're going to provide you. So please do let us know. And also at that link that I just sent everyone, linktree.thepc, um, are all the rest of our classes for our next series. So Chad is finishing up the back to school series, which is awesome, but we're about to have four assistant timpani masterclasses with Matt Strauss, David Liu, uh, Andy Watkins, and Scott Christian, all of whom will be talking about how to excel as an assistant timpanist. The series is called The Excellent Assistant. So please do sign up for those classes as well. And they're all free. The registration is free. So just jump onto these Zoom webinars with us. And that's the spiel, guys. Thank you so much. So if, if the class has brought you some massive value, please go ahead and donate. Sign up for more classes. Share this with everyone. And uh, that's it. Thank you guys so much for listening. I appreciate it. So, uh, Stephen, what questions have I missed here? There's a, there's a couple more I see that are coming in as I'm talking. Yeah, I think just um, 
Uh, one here. Oh yeah, I thought this was an interesting one for Chad. Uh, is there any difference in training for percussionists if you're in a wind band versus an orchestra? I think that's interesting. Um, your you know new position you're about to start. Um, I don't. I mean, yeah, people have asked me that before. Like, oh, how was the audition compared to orchestra auditions? Honestly, it felt comp it, exactly the same. I mean, they pretty much run it exactly the same as an orchestra audition. Maybe some of the selections of music are band specific, but it really wasn't even that much in this audition. I think there was like a few things that were band specific, but most of the excerpts that I played were orchestral excerpts. Um, yeah, I mean, the training is the same. You're, you're just trying to show that um, you can play these excerpts with a good sound, with good time, good feel. It uh, there really isn't much of a difference there. You'll have little things like for this job, there was, like I said, one rudimental etude that I had to play traditional grip um, that was specific to this job. Um, other than that, everything else was the same. Nice. <laughs> um, and the, I think, I believe this is the last question here, which is, hi, um, in Kije, Lieutenant Kije, the accents, not considering the pianissimo, are in what dynamic? Like, what dynamic do you play the accents are? Uh, uh, what dynamics do you play the accents at, considering that they're in pianissimo? I think that's the question. Sure. Um, I just think about them as just one dynamic bump up, or one, um, you know, level up from whatever the bass is. It says, you know, two P, double P, a pianissimo there. I think about the accents as being just one level up from that, so being piano, maybe. So we're going from piano, Pianissimo, piano, pianissimo. Um, but it's really, I mean, you know, it, it's, uh, you just have to sort of see what, what, you know, piano, it's subjective. What, what's piano in context of an orchestra and playing with yourself or whatever the case is? You just have to, I think the relationship is the most important thing. You don't want the accents to stick out too much. Mm. Um, you don't want them to not be there at all. It's really the relationship between the two. It's just a tiny little bump, um, you know, a little bit louder than the note that came before it and a little bit louder than the note that comes after it if you have you know one accent sticking out there so think about it more as a relationship between the two rather than maybe uh pianissimo and, and, and piano great and uh shout out to aaron who just sent in a donation thank you so much for your generosity that is awesome you guys are i mean seriously all these donations are going straight to our master class fund so that we can make sure that chad is paid for his time <laughs> and all of our artists. I mean, this, this is an important aspect of this. So guys, that it, please, uh, I'm trying to stall just a little bit because I want to make sure we have room for any more Q&A. So if anybody has any further questions, now is the time because uh, uh, otherwise we are going to uh, let Mr. Chad get ready to go to join the military and join basic training. Um, yeah, one thing I was going to say <laughs> about that is it, you know, I'm going to be in this strange situation where I, I'm not going to be allowed to play percussion or a drum or a pad for you know those two months. You know, I, I can't bring a pad and sticks to basic. So you know, this weekend I'm leaving, and then after that, then I go immediately and have to start work without <laughs> touching anything for two months. And so I was trying to think about like, okay, how am I gonna, what what am I going to do to sort of get back in shape? And it's this everything I talk about today. It's it's the warm up and the chop building and the technique and the exercises that will get me ready to um, to start playing again. I mean, I, I use this before auditions. I'll use this throughout the year, um, but I'm already thinking ahead. Like, okay, I'm going to have to use all this stuff to sort of get my hands back after being cold for <laughs> for uh, for eight weeks. So, right, but, uh, um, it, Chad, I, I have one question for you. Now that you're saying that, do you? Um... Uh, do you have a tenure review process with the U.S. Navy Band? I actually don't know the, the answer to this question. Uh, because, you know, most orchestras, guys, um, for those of you who are not taking orchestra auditions quite yet, e once you win, it's not over yet. <laughs> you have to, uh, you know, you have to go to the orchestra, and, you, and it's anywhere from six months to years. Sometimes it takes multiple years, and you'll be reviewed as a, as a musician on stage, both by your section and principals in the orchestra and the music director, uh, and you sort of 
have to have to show them that you're a, you know, a great colleague. I think getting tenure is about being a great colleague, about both being prepared for your personal part, um, but also knowing how to interact with other people as a professional person. Um, so, you know, showing up on time, not making people upset, smelling nice, you know, taking a shower. All these things are part of your tenure review process, but I don't know anything about this in the military bands. So maybe, Chad, do you, have you heard about any part of this or maybe there's some preparation you're thinking about about this process? I, I mean, yeah, it is definitely a little different. I don't think they have anything that's comparable to the sort of orchestra um, tenure, you know, year-long season or whatever the case is. I mean, I, it's almost <laughs> the opposite in a way. Like, I have signed a, you know, four-year enlistment yeah and i'm in it for four years like i think it's kind of the opposite like they can't fire me for four i don't know i'm sure i could screw it up you know and they could you know whatever the case is but it's i think for the most part like once you're in you're in and you have these four years maybe after those four years they you know you'll maybe have some sort of meeting with them i don't actually really know the answer to this mm -hmm. it's not as it's not kind of like the 10-year thing um, but you know, maybe you'll have a meeting after those four years and be like, Oh, would you like to resign or, um, whatever the case is. But I think for the most part, once you're in, you're in, right. unless you just do something terrible and get kicked out. <laughs> well, obviously the application process to joining the group before your first day on stage is far more rigorous. I mean, you're going to go through <laughs> basic training, for example. I mean, like this is a much more intense, both audition I mean, and process so yeah the, the, way, the like yeah. medical screenings and like background checks and like secret service uh, <laughs> you know questionnaires and stuff is a little different than like the orchestra setup process sure. so i think like once they've decided like okay you're in then i think they're pretty comfortable with you at that point did you go through that process in chattanooga is that do they have a tenure review there oh a tenure yeah 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 so, okay. And so this was something that you're, you've already done before. And you, so you know what I'm speaking about, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was, uh, it was a tenure position here and I got that within the first year. So I've been tenured for a few years that I've been here and right. now I'm sort of, uh, I'm technically on a one year leave and then I'll resign once I get up there and everything sort of settled and, and whatnot. Great. Awesome. Well, um, do, oh, you, maybe one more question uh steven you want to you want to ask this question and then i think we'll wrap up yeah sure i just had one last one pop in here um just uh, wondering if you have any advice uh on working on tompkins etudes um to get started on that all right so i'm working on i mean yeah so this was sort of the in my the fifth like i don't know if you're gonna call them pillars of my warm-up i got the drum core i've got ed packet i got the reich improv Sean Tilburg's book. And then the fifth one is, like I said, like the collection of just snare drum music that uh, built up over the years from the different snare drum competitions and just from different books. One of those is the Tompkins that I use a lot um, to play through. Um, as far as advice for, what well, was it advice for playing it, learning it? What was the question? Yeah, just for, for playing, getting started in, in that repertoire. I mean, I don't know if I have any like specific I don't, I don't, I don't really approach like a certain book or or etude in a different way than another. It's really the work is done beforehand. It's building up your hands to be able to play Tompkins. You know, doing all the work outside of that with technique building and exercises, so that you have the capabilities to then play the music on the page. Uh, after that, it's just you're just learning a new piece. Like I said, we, like we talked about earlier, you know, find the the tempo that's going to work and the roll bass, just going through it the same as you would any other piece. I don't really look at anything in a, in a different light there. Mm. Yeah, I, I would um, I, I would also be curious, Chad, did you, when you're getting ready for the um, those, those etudes, did you listen to certain types of recordings? I mean, I think Joe Tompkins has them all recorded or at least the first book i believe that he had recorded is, is there any other types of things besides those recordings um that you would recommend listening to in terms of that style uh 
I don't, yeah, I don't think I've really even, I'm not even sure if I've listened to the Tompkins recordings. I don't know. I kind of just, <laughs> I kind of just like to have my own uh, uh, approach to it. I don't know. I don't really want to hear what someone else did to it. I just want to play it <laughs> my way. Whatever comes out, comes out that way. So Of course, of course. Yeah, I, I just mentioned because there is there is a little bit of, um, I don't know, he, he plays with a certain sort of flair, which if you've never heard that sort of style before might inspire someone who's listening to the first sure. time, playing through them for the first time. Might take, uh, you might feel more comfortable to take some risks, both with a bit like the dynamics and the sometimes the rhythms are more crushed or more open or the, the, these sorts of things. I, I tend to find those French rudimental etudes to be a little bit... Um, they they inspire me to think more musically sometimes, um, or sure. or or that music is like injected into the composition a little bit more than our standard. How you and I grew up, you know, the standard, you know, this sort of thing where it's like it's very much not it's not written into the music at all. And if you want to make it musical, it's a hundred percent on you to do so. Um, yeah, just to be clear, I'm not saying like don't listen to other people's recordings or anything. <laughs> I mean, you should listen to as much music as you can get your hands on to uh, expose you to different types of playing and styles and all that sort of stuff. I'm just saying, I, I don't think I did for that particular thing. Yeah, I, I totally understand. No, I wasn't. I'm just giving you a hard time. Uh, <laughs> it was just funny. Caught me off guard. Uh, but yeah, guys, that uh, I think that about does it. We got to let Chad get on to his day. Thank you for sharing so much of your time with us, Chad. Um, it, it's really it, putting on this series uh, would not have been possible without our artists, all five of our artists who joined us uh, for the classes and a big, a big thanks to them and to you, Chad, and also a very big thank you to the, on my screen, the person who is now at the bottom, Mr. Stephen Keener, who this also, none of this would have happened without him. He was instrumental in coordinating all of the classes, getting information from artists, helping us determine how to best um, program and present these classes. And it, it's really been a team effort. And of course, it really wouldn't have been possible without our audience. All you guys who are watching, um, you're, you're the inspiration for our, us doing all of what we're doing is we're, we're trying to create this platform to share percussion education. And as Chad was saying, you know, we always hear Chad and I and Steven, we all heard from our teachers, you know, none of this was around. Like we didn't have computers and recording stuff when we went through. It's like, okay, but at the same time, just when the three of us were going through, uh, you know, we didn't have live Zoom classes with like the best artists ever. We didn't have Chad Crummel teaching on Zoom for free when everybody wanted to check it out. This was not a thing. Like you had to fly across the world maybe to get this information from certain artists. I mean, Ed Choi just gave this class, you know, no one, people weren't flying to Korea to get this information, but now it's here and it's accessible. So, um, you know, it's a it's a really cool time that we're all living in going through this together. And please, guys. Yeah, I said it before, but just just share this around. Let everybody know that we're doing this um, because, uh, you know, we have we have thousands and thousands of more people that we want to reach and inspire. And the, the more people who find out about it, the more possible it is to deliver better content more often. Um, but Chad, you're really setting the bar high for snare drum. You're making me want to, that was like some scary stuff you were playing, like the sevens and the singles at, <laughs> at light speed. You're like at mock, you're like at mock 14, like, wow. Okay. Um, so man, it's, yeah, it's inspiring. You're making me want to go pick up the drum before I go to bed. Appreciate it. Um, Steven, and, uh, do you have any, do you have any closing thoughts? And then Chad, will pass it to you for the, for the final word. No, yeah, I just echo what you said. Thanks again so much, Chad, and to all the artists for uh, for coming and teaching these classes. And please enjoy your last show in Chattanooga tonight. That's going to be a really special moment. And uh, and safe travels and good luck with basic and everything like that. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, oddly enough, we're uh, so tonight. Like I said, my last show, and uh, we're playing we're playing Capriccio actually. And <laughs> I was like. I don't want to have any stress for my last concert. So I gave the snare drum part to someone else. Like I'm like packing and moving. I don't want to, I don't want to work on, you know, the soft snare drum roll like two days before I leave. So I gave it to a friend who, uh, uh, who wanted to play it. So I'm going off like scot free. I'm playing some castanets and just enjoying my last concert. That's what the, the luxury you get, uh, being principal, you can, uh, sort of divide the parts how you want. So, um, yeah, I just want to say thanks to, to Josh and, uh, 
and Steven for putting this together. Thanks for uh, asking me to present at snare drum class. The idea that I wanted to get across was just for everyone to develop their own version of what I'm talking about here, this snare drum. Uh, I call it a warm up, but it's it's everything in one. It's the it's building the hands, it's the chops, it's the exercises, technique, calisthenics, whatever you want to call it. It's all sort of wrapped in one. And uh, so just inspiring you to to build your own with your own music and your own beats that you're playing to or whatever you do to get creative in the practice room and uh, to sort of further your snare drum playing. So once again, thanks again to the uh, Percussion Conservatory. Check out the next few classes that they have, the uh, assistant timpanist classes, those are gonna be really cool. I'm sad that I will miss them. I will be, I don't know, in a bunk somewhere in uh, <laughs> Chicago. So it'll be interesting. Yeah. Well, Chad, I guess it's got to be what, like almost 20 years now that you and I have uh, known each other. I think maybe even more. So it's, it's really cool to, uh, oh, wow, yeah. it's, been a, it's been a hot minute, man. It's, it's more than half our life. That's for sure. So it's, it's cool to see this coming for full circle where, you know, I, we're, we're putting this platform, you're a featured artist for us and, and that you're off to such cool things and that both of us are on, you know, opposite sides of the world playing music. It's it's crazy. We started so close, and now we're split up, but still still doing stuff together. So, uh, on a personal note, it's really it's really really cool, man. It's, I'm so happy for you to start this next part of your journey, and uh, and we'll be rooting for you. Can't wait to see you on stage with the with the Navy Band very soon. Awesome. Thanks a lot. Yeah. All right, everybody, wherever you are in the world, have a good morning, afternoon, or evening, and we will see you at the next class. Take care, guys. Bye bye. <laughs>